You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 440. Hollywood is about destroying people on your way up. If they happen to die along the way, that's a bonus. Jeffrey Katzenberg. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, today I wanted to take you down the world of commercial directing. Now, many of you might know that I got my start as a director in the commercial world. It's where I started as an intern back in the day at a big commercial production house where I was editing demo reels. And I just fell in love with uh, directing commercials because it was also in the time where David Fincher, Michael Bay, Antoine Fuqua, Spike Jones, uh, and the list goes on and on of these amazing directors that were making the transition from commercial directing over to feature film directing. And I thought that was the way I was going to make it in. But uh, it didn't work out that way. I got in other ways. But I really did love the process of directing commercials. And a lot of filmmakers find themselves directing commercials as a way to hone their skills and also make a living while they're chasing their dream of being either a feature film director or television director or so on. And today's guest is a commercial filmmaking guru and all-around nice guy. His name is Jordan Brady, and he's been directing commercials for over 30 years. And as he tells the story, he kind of fell into it because he started off as a stand-up comic. And slowly but surely, he was kind of thrown into directing comedic commercials. And from there, he just kept growing and growing to the point is 30 years later, he's got thousands and thousands of spots and tons of awards uh, as a commercial director. And he's also directed multiple comic documentaries like I Am Comic starring Louis C.K. and Sarah Silverman, as well as I Am Road Comic with Mark Marin and many, many more. Now, I wanted to bring uh, Jordan onto the show so we can do a deep dive into commercial directing and see if any of the tribe out there might want to go into commercial directing to build a production company to kind of do this stuff on the side or as full-time while they're chasing their feature film or television dreams. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jordan Brady. I'd like to welcome to the show Jordan Brady, man. How you doing, Jordan? Oh, great, Alex. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for uh, for coming on the show. I had the pleasure of going on to your great podcast about uh, commercial directing and all the cool things you talk about on your show. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of what you do, and I'm a fan of uh, all the stuff that you're doing for 
the commercial side of the business. And I've never actually had an episode dedicated to the commercial world, which is funny because I got my start in the commercial world as a commercial director and music video director. And my first jobs were in the commercial side of the business. So it's a great way to cut your teeth. It, you know, it is, especially when, when we were coming up, which was, you know, we're of similar vintages. So yeah. the game, the game's a bit different than it is uh, than back then. Um, the budget's a little bit tighter uh, nowadays um, than they were back in the 90s. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so before we get started, how did you get into this ridiculous business? I was a stand-up comedian in the comedy boom of the 80s. Dropped out of school, hit the road, and I did every state. You know, I've been to like three or four hundred cities, every state, including Alaska, Hawaii, except Maine. I've never been to Maine. And I worked clubs and colleges. And then I came to L.A. with a pit stop in San Francisco. And I was there just like six or eight months ago. You know what? This is the best city in the country to live, but not to be in entertainment beyond what I could do there. And I'm sure somebody from San Francisco, I call it Frisco because it pisses people off. I moved to LA and I started working in television. And then I, I hosted a game show, which is a natural progression from stand-up comedian to being a game show host. And I, I was a bad actor. And then I, the more I worked in television, the more I started loving behind the camera. So I did what you got to do. I wrote a film. And, and, and there, and then, but you, but then how did you go from that to commercial directing, which is a bit of a, you know, there's not a lot of stand ups doing commercial directing. Uh, well, yeah, it's interesting. When I was trying to raise money for my first indie film called Dill Scallion, it's like a country spinal tap. Okay. So we're nice. talking late 90s, you know, the when. The Soderberghs and the Quintons and the, oh, yeah, and yeah. the, uh, the uh, clerks. Kevin, uh, Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Singleton, they, Spike Lee. That, yeah, all yeah. Of them, yeah, yeah. They all did the thing. Who was the guy that owned the bar and Harvey came in? Oh, that would be, that would be Troy, Troy, Saint. Troy, Troy Duffy. Yes, Troy Duffy. Yes. I actually love those movies, by the way. And I also like, love his documentary, Overnight, which was – a, a manda it's mandatory for every filmmaker to watch Overnight. I took my son, Jake, to see that movie with me. Which one, Boondock when, or Overnight. No, no, overnight. Okay. Overnight, when he was like, I mean, maybe 12 or 13, because we were hanging during the day, and I go, hey, this is going to be a little over your head, but, you know, he grew up on set, my kids, mm -hmm. and my once my other son's a director now. Mm -hmm. He's 25. He's shooting a music video today. Awesome. Uh, ben. So anyway, uh, we go to see uh, Overnight, and when we walked out, there was a producer I had done a movie with. He goes... Why did you bring your – you brought your son? I go, he can handle it. And the guy – my son goes, yeah, I kind of got it. Don't worry. You know, <laughs> I, I get what's going on. Uh, but I love that. So when I was raising money, I had already done promos. This is an interesting piece of cartilage. As a comedian, I did a lot of stuff on Comedy Central, and I hosted an MTV game show. So I knew th those people, and I started doing promos. Like I would write and produce and direct promos for Comedy Central, which was great that they were in New York because in L.A. they would just give me what seemed like a bag of money, like 20, 30 grand. I would make this film and send it to them and they go, great. One of them was with Dave Chappelle, this young 25 year old kid. Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> and one was Kathy Griffin, who was like in the alt comedy scene. So. They were, I knew those comedians and I knew how to direct and produce. And I just, they paid for my, they were my film school. And then I started doing it for NBC out here. And I hosted a show on NBC with Mario Lopez. It was never heard of your adventure. Yeah. Never, he never heard of him. It's the same, by the way. I, I, I know. I, I, I used to watch him on Saved by the uh, Bell. The dude is like him, Cher, and J Lo. They all, uh, they all bathe in the same blood of infants. Um, to they're vampires. I think they are. Uh, there's no question. <laughs> so basically, NBC had Mario during the Saved by the Bell years. It was called Name Your Adventure, and a kid would write in a letter, and we would take them on these adventures. But they needed a second banana for, for things that were too risky 
per the insurance for Mario, for Mario to do. So Jordan Brady went shark diving. Jordan Brady jumped out of a plane. Jordan Brady went to uh, space camp and and anything that was kind of dangerous, I would do. You were the stunt. You were the stunt double. That's awesome. <laughs> so I started directing that show, uh, which was, I mean, I literally, it was a life changing moment. I went to the producers and said, Hey, cause NBC set me up with an interview and I go, Hey, I know I'm supposed to be this host. I show up and I do funny things, but I really want to direct. And, and the guy almost laughed me out of the room. And to this day, Scott Friedland is one of my good friends. He said, okay, if you produce, I need producers. I don't need directors. If you produce six, you can direct one. And by season three, I was directing more than I was even hosting. That's So awesome. to answer your question, I'm doing that, and I'm doing these promos, and I go, well, I, now I wrote a feature. So I write this. It's a country spinal tap, right? And I'm going to make the movie. Uh, I, uh, this is probably interesting to your fans. Look, I pitched the movie to Hollywood pictures with that sentence, country, Western spinal tap four words sold in the room, wrote the script, got paid, goes into turnaround executives leave. I yes. buy the script back and they charge me an extra $15,000 interest uh, dinners, trips we had taken. We went to Vegas to see a comedian to star in. It was crazy. Right. So I'm pitching these production companies in the late 90s. Will you invest in my movie? All production companies. Propaganda had a film division. Right? HSI, who ended up making an uh, indie film with. HKM was a company. Who were the others? Uh, oh, God. There was a bunch of them out there. Yeah, know, but, like, yeah. All the produ commercial production companies wanted to. And one of them goes, we're not giving you any money for your movie, but we have this commercial for you to direct. So I did it. And then, and people hate this part of the story. I'm, I'm at my same son, my same son's plural, uh, daycare center in Hollywood. And one of the moms, <laughs> the best, her son is the best friend of my kid. She goes, Jordan, you, you know, I know you're making your film. Do you want to do commercials? I'm like, I love commercials. I wanted to be Darren Stevens when I was a kid. You know, I, I've been directing promos. And she goes, well, yeah, you got to come over and meet our people. And she just worked in the office. She was the manager, of the, not in the creative side. They signed me. Who was they? Been, Who was they? It's called HKM, which was a big, big company in, in the 80s and 90s. And I was at HCAM for a couple of years and uh, bounced around, and I've been doing it ever since. That was that that's, was nineteen ninety eight, and that's uh, and that's Hollywood. That is one of the things that happens out here in L.A. when you just bump into the person who's your best friend of your kid at a. It, those are those little a park bench. Those are those kind of ridiculous L.A. stories that pisses people off. But you know what? I've been involved with those those stories. And I used to be the one pissed off because I was from Florida. And I would hear these stories and I would watch movies about it. And I was like, this it must be it must be amazing to be out here in LA. Oh my God, it's great. And I gotta tell you, I've been out here now 13, 13 years or so, 13, 14 years. And I gotta say, the first two years, the streets were paved with gold. Like everywhere, I was so excited to be here. And like everywhere you turn, there was a post house. There was a studio. There was like, oh, is that an actor I know? Oh my God, everyone has final draft in Starbucks open. This is where the action is. Oh my God. And that was two years. And I was working and I was doing a lot of posts and I was directing and I was really enjoying it. But then after like a couple of years, the sheen starts to, to go off of LA. It just starts to – and then all of a sudden you start finding yourself you're like – why do I love it here? I don't understand. I do love it. I do like it here and I want to stay here, but I don't know why anymore. And then all of us, and I, we were talking about this before the show is like, if you want the perfect analogy of LA, it's watch the Oscars on television. And then when, uh, you know, when, and watch Hollywood Boulevard, how it looks during the Oscars and then come and visit Hollywood Boulevard when the Oscars aren't there. And that's a perfect representation because what happens in Hollywood Boulevard, sir, you've been here for a minute. <laughs> Well, you, you on TV during the Oscars, there's Klieg lights and limousines and red and, carpets and red carpets and fans cheering and self, you know, flashes going off. 
And then within 17 hours, that same street is populated with uh, teenage runaway hippies uh, that smell like patchouli, a guy with a needle in his arm, and another guy dressed as a, you know, a mermaid with a jock strap on his head. It, it's it's lunatics and and, uh, and that is shops now. But by the way, that is the good part of Hollywood Boulevard. If you start going down a few blocks, it starts getting a little shady. <laughs> Funny. Because the tourist area is what you're talking about, like where the Chinese theater is. And that, that's the tourist area. You go down three, four blocks, you better hold on to your purse, especially at night. I, I feel bad for families that have spent their, oh, money their to fly life out savings to come out and vacation and go to Hollywood. Like I'd go to the beach. You know, yeah, go to Santa Monica. Universal or yeah. Go to, yeah, go Disney. To yeah, abs- absolutely. And then and there's Venice, and we could have a talk conversation all about Venice. I can only take Venice for about 15, 20 yeah. minutes. I can't, I can't. I physically can't take the energy there. It's just like it's everything's bombarding you. There's a guy who's a buff bodybuilder with his G string driving around his roller skates, and then there's somebody <laughs> like, and there's literally a freak show, literally a freak show on Venice. Like there's a standing freak show. And you see the bearded dude come out, and you like yeah. the the head, the face, the guy's face is all like it's, it's insane. It's insane. L.A. is such an insane place to be. <laughs> but but here's the here's the flip side because I've raised four kids here. Yeah, God bless and, you. And I, God bless you. I do, and I do love it here. I do. I, too. I love it because, I mean, I live in a neighborhood. I have family. I have a small group of friends. Right. I like the people I work with and, and Venice, you're talking about Venice beach and the boardwalk. I mean, there are pockets. You go a oh, block here and a block there. there. It's yeah. like New York, you know, yeah. every block is, is a different yep, absolutely. little ecosystem. And that's the same thing. Like I live in a neighborhood that could be, you know, St. Louis, a suburb of St. Louis or same here or North of Miami. Or it, it's just a, a little pocket. Yeah, but outside that pocket, it could get it could get a little interesting sometimes, depending on where you live. Oh, it's crazy! It's no, it's crazy here in LA too. That's the one thing. Like you're literally driving, and you're in like Beverly Hills, and then you're driving a little bit farther, and you are like, you do not want to get out of the house, like, out of the car. It's like an insane. But that's New York too. That's any big city almost. Like there's really good pockets, real bad pockets. We've kind of gone off off the track a little bit, but LA is 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 kind of all about the story, the the myth of, of, you know, being in LA and being in Hollywood. And, uh, like I said, I've said so many times before, it's about the sizzle here, not the steak. Hollywood's really good at selling that sizzle, but they suck at selling the steak <laughs> because it's, that's what they do. And, and if people, and, and we were talking about this before, um, you can make a living nowadays as a filmmaker anywhere. Oh, Absolutely. And you may have to work harder. You may have to take less sexy jobs in other cities. But there's an abundance of work. And I've noticed in commercials, uh, you, you may have to wear multiple hats. Now you do. Absolutely. Some, sometimes at once. But, like, I used to work in, in Kansas City all the time. And my dear friend Rick was the best line producer He's the only guy I know that's been to Sundance three times with three different movies, uh, would produce my commercials. And then I'd be talking to him on the phone. I go, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm location scouting for this this big uh, Google commercial. So he would location scout for another producer. And then I would go and I'd be like, hey, Brian, you were doing props the last time. He goes, yeah, I'm this time I'm uh, I'm going to be a grip. You know, like. Inter de- switching departments, but you have to because in like when you and I were coming up, you could be just a commercial director, like that. That you literally just showed up, did your job, and left. And and to many extents, there are still those guys and girls out there yeah. that do that. But once you start getting out of the upper echelon. And you start dropping down towards Hollywood Boulevard and less from the Oscars yeah. and more towards Hollywood Boulevard. Um, you you got to start wearing more hats and you got to start doing things. And you might have to produce a little bit. You might have to do this a little bit. And, you, and then because the budgets, I mean, the budgets were wonderful in the 90s. I mean, in the early 2000s, yeah. the budgets were just 
I mean, I mean, it was insanity, the money that was being spent. Before the dot-com bu- bu- a bubble popped, oh my God, there was so much money. So much money. I mean, I remember Miami had 13 post houses. And I know that doesn't sound a lot in LA thing, but that, that's a small market. We had 13, like six of them were like major post facilities. And I used to work on all of them. And I would either be editing or I'd be directing or something like that. And then once the top com bubble popped, it all just it ended up being with they ended up with like one, if that. And yeah, there were all gone. there were there were five about four years ago, and then the the second bloodletting got it down to basically two. Where is that in, in Miami? In Miami, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I work in Miami. I, I look. I'm blessed that I get decent budgets. Uh, I mean, I am a working commercial director. It is my vocation. It's my bread sure. and butter, and and they're nice national clients. Like I've done every car brand, but to your point, okay, I have been doing it twenty two years. There's that. There's that. <laughs> but to your point, I edited a job that my buddy got for this plant based protein thing. He goes, "Hey, uh, can I use your office, and we'll set up a little edit suite." And I go, yeah. And as a matter of fact, I didn't get the dog food job. So how about I edit for you? And I edited with him with all the humility and grace of a guy that just wants to bring home some pizza and Slurpees for my family. Right? Like if if I tell anybody in 2020 and not just this year, if you can put your ego aside, you can make money. So – Yes, I and you're right. I will produce and and make a little. It, it's it's more like when I produce, I don't make money, but I save money. But right? do you? Because, well, do you own your own gear and rent it out to the production? I don't own anything. You don't own anything. So I because I own, when I was coming up, a lot of the commercial directors I knew actually owned lenses and lighting packages and stuff, and they would just rent them out as a side hustle to generate a little bit more revenue. For, oh yeah, uh, my, no. My son has a, you know, he has a, a red. Yeah. He has a lens package. He bought these cool Russian lenses. Mm-hmm. We have a whole like right over here in my studio. We have lights, sound, but nothing that I would rent out for a, uh, a Toyota commercial. Sure. Like I would, I would rather the DP get the money and the grips. Like I bought a slider. I was on a shoot and said, so "This guy, <laughs> I knew a guy. He goes, I bought this slider. I'm never using it." And I bought the slider. I, he like literally. He I think a hundred bucks, and you know it, it was worth five six hundred bucks. Right. And I took it to a shoot, and I go, hey, let's use the slider. And the grip goes, well, I have a slider on the truck. <laughs> and I go, well, no, I brought the slider. I put it in my car because I just got this new slider. And he just he was very uh, respectful, but he was kind of like. Oh. Why? And I went, a light bulb went out. I go, oh. He's not going to get to rental. Grip, he, the key grip wants to rent the thing. I go, buy my slider. But just give me 200 bucks. You'll have an extra one. Done. I never did it again. Like, it literally, like, what an asshole I was. But that was also, but that's also in today's world where you could buy gear, where before a lens, like, like I remember, the, like, you're buying lens packages. That, that was, you're talking about 50,000. Oh yeah, yeah. Hundred thousand. So like the grip couldn't bring the the DP couldn't own those things unless he was a big time DP and lighting pack a grip truck. That that was we're talking about like half a million dollar investment. But you're you know those these are the days of commercial directors making yeah. just you know we're talking million dollar budgets, half million yeah, dollar oh, budget. Yeah. It was it was it was an amazing bank. But I wanted to ask you what is the yeah. biggest myth in directing commercials that you would like to dismiss right now? Because, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times people come to me and they've asked me about my commercial past and like, is it, a, is it a good way to get in? Is it this? I'm like, look, guys, it's a completely different world. Like I couldn't even comprehend in today's world to do what you're doing on a daily basis as a commercial director. And the only reason you can do what you're doing on a daily basis as a commercial director is because you've got 22 years of relationships and experience and you're on that list of guys there's a short list of guys that do this kind of work, and they're like, "Oh yeah, th- for the the big spots, we give it to him because we know it's just going to get done right." But like for a young kid to come in right now, like a twenty year old, a twenty five year old, to start building that up without relationships, yeah, and just trying to get like picked up by a production company, 
and get represented. Oh, dude. And sending out reels and oh my God, I don't even know how to do it now. So what are some myths you think? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the three R's that I teach, preach, and shout from the mountaintop, it's your reel, it's your relationships, and it's revenue. Those are the three reasons to do a job. You either want it for your reel, you're doing it because it's a cool relationship or a good relationship to have, or you just need the money. And rarely is it all three. That is the holy trifecta if you get all three of them. Repeat business is the the only way that I have a career. Is, is, and repeat business comes from comes from relationships and it comes from having a great reel and never never delivering dog shit and the revenue is the least important which is weird because you think you want to chase that big money gig but i would rather do a series of lower budget jobs for really cool people with great creative repeatedly than to poo poo like nobody's poo poo and work anymore um and before i give you some of the myths Alex, there is a list, and, and my wife hates when I say this publicly because I am an A-plus filmmaker. I can step on set. You could hand me the script. I can direct the shit out of it. Mm -hmm. But in the marketplace, I'm a B-plus because I'm not on the top, top list. <gasps> oh, no, you're, you're like, not like, like David Fincher. David, David Fincher, yeah. Any move, anybody with a movie that, had, that was a hit is, is even an A-plus-plus plus are they entertaining a commercial? Then there's these guys like Tom Kuntz, the Polorian brothers, these guys, I just love their work. They do a lot of Geico, your funniest Geico ads. Like, uh, it's Pit, it's Pitka. It's Pitka still around, right? Well, because, still... Yeah. But that's, he's is an anomaly, right? Yeah. Um, but can you get away? Oh, oh, we're going to get back to Pitka in yeah. a minute. Cause I, I got to talk to you about Pitka. Go ahead. I don't think there could be another Pitka. I don't think you could be an asshole. Can you be a Pitka today? Is Pitka can no. Pitka be Pitka today? Is he, I mean he can't. Pitka can be Pitka, but and can I, he though? I met him. He was a sweetheart, but I know people that worked with him that like an actor well, goes. He threw a football at me, and oh my no. wife worked with him. Was like he's broken legs. You couldn't he's, do. Oh no, farting you couldn't and, do that. Farting in, farting in clients' faces. Literally, I've seen, I've heard these stories from people on set. They're like, he literally was walking upstairs and the client was behind him and he farted in the guy's face. He goes, that's what I think of you. And these are the oh. kind of stories you hear and you're just like, are you, is this man real? And by the way, if okay. anyone doesn't know who we're talking about, we're talking about Joe Pitka, the director of Space Jam. Um, and every Clydesdale. <laughs> every uh, Budweiser Clydesdale plot. commercial. Absolutely. But it, it, the guy who, um. Why am I blanking? He owns Hungry. Brian Buckley mm -hmm. has done more Super Bowl com commercials, maybe not as many as Pika, but he has multiple ones. And he's, from what I've heard, one of the nicest guys. And he's your comedy go-to. And, and that's that list of, of guys with million-dollar budgets. Oh, yeah. Huge daily budgets, great fees. And they're that list. And then your Jordan Brady is like, oh, we couldn't get that, but Jordan could mimic that. You know, he, I do, like, I do a lot of cars. I is do that a bad, celebrities. Is, that's not a, bad, not a bad thing at all. It's not, it's, 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 I, Jordan, I'm not, I don't understand why you're saying this. It's not a bad thing to be the, you know, on the bench uh, after Fincher. I mean, I, I'm, I'd be cool with I, that. <laughs> I'm very cool with my, my place, but no, my wife is like, you know, you're a plus. I go, but the difference, and this is what I think filmmakers need to understand the difference between your skill and your talent your gift as a storyteller filmmaker right? and where you are in the marketplace. Completely it's different. great when they align, but they're two separate things. And if you can't objectively look at yourself as a commodity and where do I need to improve? And sometimes maybe they want more sizzle. Sometimes they're star fuckers. They just, they want the guy that did uh, oh. Napoleon dynamite. Oh like, my God. Longest time. Napoleon dynamite. Oh, like, we, if you want Wes Anderson, go get Wes Anderson. But for your your one hundred and ten thousand dollars for a union crew and SAG actors, you're probably not going to get Wes Anderson. We'll try to ring out a spot, right? And Wes Anderson's price fee is a hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> so here's some myths. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. 
And now back to the show. Your short film doesn't mean crap to anyone. Amen. As a commercial director. No one cares about your short film. No one's going to watch it. No one's going to watch your, really, your two-minute short film. No one cares. And more and more, people want to see 15 seconds. I do six-second commercials sometimes. Well, this is a different world now, yeah. fifteen Before, for me, it was 15 second, 30 second, and, you know, 60 second, if, the, if that. It's still 15 and 30, but more more 15 and, and the 30 is still alive. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, but it's not it's not 37 seconds. No. So one one myth is your director's cut of your commercial <laughs> had better be on point with the brand messaging. It, it, right? Because if it's 37 seconds and it has all the jokes but it doesn't have like but a second of a product shot, people are going to go, "Well, why did it take 37 seconds to tell a 30 second story?" Like it actually hurts you. Your director's cut. Right. So I actually remember seeing, you know, I always watch the Super Bowl every year. So I always love watching it for the commercials as well as the game. And I always look at them and the commercials, a lot of times, the best commercials have wonderful creative, but I don't remember the product. Yeah. And that's, that's a great directing feat, but it's horrible for the client because I don't remember the, I don't remember the, uh, the product. Like I still remember this great spot. Like E Trade, I'll give you two two examples. There was one I'll never forget this E Trade commercial where a monkey. There's like two weird looking dudes in a, in a in a in a garage. The monkey comes up, the dude hits a boombox, and the monkey sits there and just starts dan- with an E Trade T shirt on and starts dancing for twenty five seconds. There's nothing, and the, and then like these kind of like you know deliverance looking guys are just slapping their knees in a garage somewhere. And at the end, it goes. We just wasted three million dollars. What are you doing with your mo- with your money? Perfectly on brand, funny, great, creative, tension re- grabbing. Decades later, I still remember that damn thing. There was another commercial that I saw, which was like um, some guys out in the in the boon, uh, like in the bayou, in a house, and uh, they're just there and they're drinking some hot sauce. And there's a mosquito that lands on his arm. He drinks it, and then as the mosquito goes off, he exples because it's right. so hot. I don't remember the hot sauce. I remember there was a hot sauce. I have no it, idea. What it the might have was. been Tabasco. It wasn't. It, it wasn't. It, been... it wasn't a major one. It was. A, it was an uh. off. It was a. It was like we're taking our shot with the Super Bowl commercial. So yeah, baby puppy monkey was one a few years ago, and I can't remember if it was Mountain. Oh yeah, I remember. Pepper. Yes, I remember baby yeah. puppy monkey. Yeah, I have no no recollection of it. So yes, you you definitely as a commercial director. You should be making commercials that work with the brand and not just being making a cool spot because the clients are going to want to hire you. And your spec spot Mm -hmm. cannot look like a spec spot. Mm -mm. So another big myth is if you put it on Vimeo and you say uh, my Nike spec spot, you've already tainted the viewer by calling it a spec spot and they don't care if you use an Alexa Mini in the Zeiss lenses. They don't care. No one cares. They just put the name of the commercial and the product and, and, and hopefully someone will be tricked that it was a real commercial. That's the biggest thing people do with spec spots. And, drive. and people send me their spec spot. Jordan, what do you think of this spec spot? I go, why would you tell me it's a spec spot? Because now I'm going to watch it and go, well, it's kind of a spec spot. Well, it's, not, it's it, yeah. No, no. So I, I'll, I'll tell my quick, uh, my spec spot stories back in the nineties when I did my spec spots, it cost me 50,000 to do my spec spot reel. Yeah. I, I shot 35 cause I, I knew the yeah. game and beautiful productions, all this stuff. And I originally had one of my, and we, we did the, the three quarter inch tapes to send them out to everybody through FedEx and stuff like that. And I, I did a commercial and it, I put Nike at the end of it cause it was a sports commercial. I put Nike at the end of it. And then after a little bit, I decided, you know what? I'm going to change this. I'm going to put Body Glove. So I changed the logo instead of Nike to Body Glove because now all of a sudden, he there's no way in hell this kid did Nike. But he could have done a body. Maybe, yeah. Maybe a Body Glove. And I got more reaction because of that. Another thing I did, which was That's biggest, very smart, by the way. Always I, go for a, a third tier brand. That could actually, you could actually you believe. You call your bluff. Right. And then I did another spot, which was... Yeah, it was rough. It was rough because it was beautifully shot. It was very artistic and it was all, it was like edgy, 
But unfortunately, um, it, it, it didn't it, like it was a little too cool for school. So it was like it, basically the commercial was this beautiful girl on a bed uh, sleeping. Um, and then we intercut that with her doing drugs, going crazy in the bathroom. So we got Nine Inch Nails with Disney music. And I intercut both of them back and forth. And it's based on an ad that I saw. This is a spec spot. So I put it all together. And at the very end, this woman, this woman's just lying there. And then you, as, as you pull back, you see that she's got um, drugs on the, on the bed and like you know, pill bottles and things like that. This is not a very PC commercial and all this stuff. And you pull back in her hair. It's perfect. And the tagline is great hair never dies. And, <laughs> and, and it was for like, and I did it for like this really fancy, um, like some fancy hair salon in New York, which again, people could have maybe thought about it. And I was trying to do like the really cool, like you remember that heroin commercial back in the day? I forgot if it's Fincher director, someone like that directed, where it's like this guy's like literally ODing and uh, with heroin. It wasn't for heroin. No, it it was against heroin. It's not for, (laughs) you don't really need a commercial for heroin. I think it sells sells itself. itself. I mean, no, but it was about like, he's like doing drugs and he's in this dirty toilet and he's like throwing up on himself. And at the, and you're hearing during the entire commercial, heroin, it's the thing to do heroin. It's from, so it was this beautiful juxtaposition. So that's what I was trying to attempt to do. But I got a lot of reps that used to rep me. They're like, dude, we got to pull that spot off. It's scaring people off. And I'm like, oh, fuck, it's so beautiful. Goes, yeah, but it's scaring people off. Got to pull it off the reel. Yeah. Sometimes a spoof doesn't work. A sp- I did a spoof commercial and people are like, nah, it's more like a, an SNL sketch. So that, that doesn't help as much. And the, um, but I will say this in this era, a couple, uh, like a year or so ago, I interviewed Kirsten Emhoff, who's the EP and founder of Pretty Bird. And they have Paul Hunter. It's Paul Hunter's company with her. Mm-hmm. They have Paul Maddock, who did Old Town Road video and a bunch of great commercials recently, really popped. I think I'm saying his name right. Paul Maddock. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll have to Google it. We'll have to Google it. Um, and she said, you know, I'm tired of seeing spec spots. She, I, I would rather see a young person's, like, take a, a song and do a music video to it. You don't need the artist in it. Just make a cool representation of your voice as a filmmaker. Um, but back to the myth, the other myth is, uh, well, now you don't, the myth is you don't have to be in L.A. Right. Wait, the, the myth is you have to be in L.A. Right. I think don't. now you could you, you could be in any city. You just have to make yourself available. But um, the, the other myth that people think is the director writes the spot. So the director is like a midwife. You know, the agency and the client gave birth to this idea. And the idea was vetted and it was sold by an account team and a, a product manager and a chief marketing officer at the client end. Like if you're going to make a commercial, if, if you're up for a commercial for bounty paper towels, the script and the tagline, the quicker picker upper, I don't even know if they still use that, but let's Mm -hmm. just say that's all, that's not going to change. So if you pitch your crazy idea, you're not helping. You're, (laughs) you, you have to pitch your ideas that build On their idea, I always tell people it's like throwing logs on a fire that was started before you got to the campsite. You don't need to start a new fire. You don't. It's already gone on the fire. It's already gone. Just get some more wood, stoke it a little bit, make it better, and people love it. And so the director doesn't write the commercial, and she doesn't rewrite the entire thing. But you still find that you're putting your stamp on it. And I was using the, the, the analogy, the, you know, the, uh, the wet nurse, not wet nurse, the, uh, midwife, the midwife analogy. And another director, the commercial director, Rachel Harms, she said, you know, I like dressmaker. Cause if you think of a dressmaker, like, uh, Daniel day Lewis in, uh, Oh, um, in, dre- in, is this dressmaker? I think magic, it's called it. the, magic. The, no, oh. no, it's the thread. Oh, secret th- thread. Uh, the, the Phantom Thread. Phantom Thread. Yes. Which would be a great Lego movie. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in Phantom Thread, he had an idea. He had a creative vision for the dress 
but it was based on what the princess wanted or the client wanted. And she, Rachel said to me, Jordan, think about it. You're a dressmaker because you have this wonderful craft and you have an art, artisan's eye and you're really specialized at these kind of dresses. But if the client thinks her arms look fat in that dress, you're going to put some sleeves on it. Absolutely. And she's right. And, and, uh, and so the, that's a big myth that you come in and you tell everybody, get out of my way. I'm going to take your dog shit script and make it a winner. And, and, I, and uh, from my experience, that kind of attitude does kind of work only at the very top echelon. So if you're hiring Michael Bay, David Fincher, Ridley Scott, um, Spike Jones, Antoine Fuqua, any of these – monsters you want them to come in and kind of not just like do two boards because you're paying them an obscene amount of money they're going to come in and maybe they'll rewrite maybe they'll work on some stuff maybe they'll add some things um but that doesn't generally work for we're talking about the top one percent of one percent even those people you mentioned are doing a conference call oh absolutely they're not just they, coming they in it- they, they don't come in and just take over but they definitely have a little bit more input than i would <laughs> in that conversation same, same conversation yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, maybe not. That's kind of a myth. I mean, the when the superstar directors, especially the feature people, do uh, take on a commercial, a lot of it has already been plotted out. Now, conversely, there's um, there's a campaign that I've done for eight years in a row where the initial job the initial assignment eight years ago was one picture of a cat wearing sunglasses and some song lyrics and there was nothing else and they said whatever you want to do we just we got a cat with sunglasses and i ended up putting a (laughs) turtleneck sweater and a gold medallion and brought in a bulldog and a leather jacket and three other cats in pink wigs and they wanted that right and that was a that was a modest budget. That, I mean, that was probably two twenty-five for a day. So that was healthy, right? Eight years ago. Now that would be that would be almost two days. Mm-hmm. I mean, in some social media budgets, Alex. I mean, social oh. media budgets. That's the training ground for the for your listener right now, doing social media projects with a small crew that's nimble. That's where you break in as a young filmmaker doing commercials and you'll get your 10,000 hours. You'll develop your voice. You'll learn how to collaborate. You'll learn how to work with a DP and an agency. And if you don't like it, you still got those hours in on set. Now go make your feature. Now, um, can you talk a little bit about there's a there's an uh, not an anomaly, but it's something that is very specific in the commercial world. That is, there is a little bit of it in the feature world and television world, but much more so in the commercial world, which is specialization. That you are the tabletop guy, or you are a comedy director, or you are a dialogue director, which freaking pissed me off when I wouldn't get jobs because they're like, oh, there's no dialogue over you. I'm like, dude, I can direct someone talking. I mean, it just used to get me so irritated. Um, but that they really put you in boxes in commercials. And they do so in, I mean, as a feature director, as a television director, like you specialize. Like, oh, you're the action guy. And, and occasionally you got the Coen brothers who can just jump back and forth. But yeah. that's... Look at Knives Out. He just jumped... From Star Wars to Knives Out. Like, From Star Wars to Knives Out. That was insane. But he also <clears throat> has now established himself as like the Coen brothers is like I had, I had uh, Barry Sonnenfeld on and I was talking to him about Raising Arizona. And he goes, uh, because I'm like, how did you go from Blood Simple to Raising Arizona with the Coens? He goes, oh, that was strategic. They wanted to do that. They wanted to make sure that they could do both because Blood Simple has nothing to do with Raising yeah, Arizona. Movie, both of them are amazing movies. But then they started doing that. Like now it's there. Like they could do whatever they want. Spielberg could do whatever that he wants. Scorsese, I mean, he's done a couple comedies, but generally speaking, Scorsese is Scorsese. Um, though I would like to see a David Fincher comedy. That I would pay good money to see a David Fincher comedy. <laughs> I think he could do a comedy. Oh, I think if he would was be. It, if the material was there on the page. I think it would be okay, amazing. So, Go ahead. So, ahead. Alex, your, your question is, they put you in a box, right? Right. Do they put you in a box? 
Um, I will use a Tai Chi move and say, <laughs> especially starting out, put yourself in a box. Make yourself easy to sell. If I if I'm starting out and I have comedy dialogue and then I have this spot for Mother's Day that makes you cry, I'm telling a sales agent, a rep, to go choose choose what I do. Because someone is selling you, like your agent, we call them reps. You want to have a box that they can put you in so that you get more opportunities. Because the more scripts you get put up for, the more conference calls you get to be on, the more likely you are to win that job. So, the, uh, and I teach this in, uh, it's in my commercial directing masterclass, available mm-hmm. at commercialdirectingmasterclass.com. And we will speak and, of that, so we will speak of that soon. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And the boot camp <laughs> is put yourself in a box. So I am a comedy dialogue director. Right. But I also, here's the big secret. You can be in different boxes for different people. There's a group of people in New York that think I am a kid's director. Yes. And there's a bunch of people in L.A. that think I do special effects, like high-end visual effects, with comedy. And there's another group in Detroit that know I, I excel at celebrities, comedy, and cars. Like the intersection of those three things. I did... Catherine Hahn for Chrysler, uh, Goldberg, the wrestler. We did some fun stuff for Dodge, uh, Jim Gaffigan for Chrysler. Like that weird intersection. It's is very, where I live. very specific. Very, very specific. specific. Very specific. And specific. someone will call and go, hey, um, we've got a script. They have a celebrity. It's, a, it's for a car brand. We want to put you up for it. I'm like, fucking A. And that was the thing. I when I got my start in the commercial business, I was a dub. I was in the dub room, so I would be making dubs all day. And I had directors with dialogue reel, with a comedy reel, um, with an action reel. Uh, it was all relative, and they all had specific reels. So they would get a call for a job, and they're like, "I need a copy of um, his dialogue reel, or we're going to cut a fresh dialogue reel for him, or we're going to cut a comedy reel." So they were always presenting different boxes, but you would never send. And occasionally, you would get a full demo that had a little bit of everything. Occasionally, but it was rare. You would generally it work. It generally would be unless they asked for it specifically, or there was a relationship or something like that. They would ask for a specific thing, and that's the thing. I was biggest mistake I made when I did my spec reel. I had. I had a sports action. Good variety. I had sports action. I had a comedy and I had a suicide air commercial. <laughs> oh, that was the thing. And, and I had a Trojan, a Trojan condoms comedy commercial. So I literally had four different spots on my, on my demo reel and they were all over the place. So it took them a minute to figure out who I was. Well, that's another myth we should point out mm-hmm. that variety does not help. That's a myth. It, it, <laughs> myth, right? Variety and, and, and having bench helps, but only if they're all in the same genre. Yeah, you could be a comedy director, a comedy dialogue director, a comedy kids director, a comedy visual yeah. effects director. You know, uh, you know, I don't know if they're calling you for the, the next great action, uh, you know, spot or a Victoria's yeah. Secret spot. You yeah. know, they're not call- – that's not – that's not the unless on, the models on like trip and have a pie in their face. and then and then opposite then you're the guy then, then you're the guy so that's by the way that, you know what else you know what else sucks uh-huh. what another myth yeah the montage is, oh. is doesn't help oh if no you yeah, were, the- if you send me your <laughs> montage as a director no okay, no the, cares. the no ad cares. agency and the eps at the production companies everybody goes great montage love the fire explosion Love that you shot the with the influencer, but guess what? I need to see the spots. So what you've done is, I mean, maybe plain devil's advocate, the montage gets you in the door, but you've really just prolonged the inevitable that someone who's going to sell your talent to make you a working director has to see the the finished product. They mm-hmm. they think. What what is she hiding by showing us a montage instead of the full commercial? Right, and in, and in the director's mind, he's like, "I'm going to show him. I'm going to show everything I could do oh. and all the highlights of my career." And I remember, I never ever cut montages. Like my my sales reps would tell me, "Do not 
cut a montage. Do not put like this cool explosions, everything like that. I had one director friend of mine who edited, had me edit together a celebrity reel. Because he's the celebrity guy. Yeah. And yeah. that's a thing that he's done a lot of spots with celebrities. And this is a thing I feel, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that agencies have so much pressure, just like studio executives do, have so much pressure on them per spot, depending even if the bigger the budget, the bigger the client, they have a lot of pressure to, to bring this home. And if they take a chance on a comedy guy doing a Victoria's Secret spot, it exposes them to get fired or lose their job or lose the lose client, the account. lose yeah. the account. So they have to play it safe. So that's why literally I had conversations with like, we love your work, but this spot has dialogue. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I've shot up, like I shot a feature. I shot these shorts and this is like, they're like, that's nice. We just need a 30 second spot with people talking in it. And I'm like, you guys are out of your fucking minds. Like, yeah, I was so pissed off, but that is the reality. And you have to understand from their point of view, they got to mitigate risk. And, yeah. and then when they, and that's one of the reasons why a guy like you, and please correct me if I'm wrong, someone like you with the experience you have, you're a safe bet for an agency to go, Jordan's going to do this. He's done a 1200. And if something goes wrong, they got their ass covered. I'm like, dude, the guy's done 1200 commercials. Look at his reel. Like I, it's not, it's not me. It's not me. Right. Literally since we've been talking, someone just said <laughs> food and comedy. Yeah. So they wanted to, do I have any food and comedy? And, and <laughs> you see how and ridiculous gonna get, we're going to get a, we're going to get a DP. Or sometimes the tabletop director mm. does the food portion of the stuff of the commercial. Yeah, like when you know when they cut to the beautiful steak and the shrimp and that is around, and that is by the way everyone a different person. And by the way, everyone listening, tabletop guys and gals, that's a. Ho- I mean, my my first boss was a tabletop guy, so I knew. Really? Yeah, he was he was one of the big tabletop guys down in the southeast, and I saw all the commercials, and it is a. Fr- and his wife was a a, a food um. Was it prepper or stylist? Uh, food stylist. stylist. Thank you. Food stylist. Fluffer. And a, fluff, a, a food fluffer. Yes. <laughs> and the stuff that they would do and how they made it look beautiful. It was a whole other thing. And we yeah. lost an account. I, I, I shit you not. They lost an account because the hamburger didn't look good in the spot. And it kind of looked grody in the shot that they did. And they lost the account. Because the, the hamburger didn't look good. And it was, that's the kind of ridiculousness and pressure that you as a director in the commercial world are sometimes. And sometimes they will spend a day on the damn bottle <laughs> and okay. give you, and give you like two hours to shoot the spot. <laughs> I was so fortunate in the, in the early to mid 2000s to do Kellogg's Eggo waffles. And it was a guy in a waffle suit made by Stan Winston, you know, legacy effects. Of course. Jurassic Park. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, You you name it. They made the waffle suit and they had, uh, you know, the guy who was a waffle. In fact, when he was off doing a a Peter Jackson thing with some of their effects, uh, Christopher Swift was his name, the guy who played the waffle. His understudy had to come in. I was like, "Mm, he's just not the right breakfast item. (laughs) Uh, but we did. He doesn't have waffle today. experience. He doesn't, he doesn't have waffle, have waffle experience. experience. He's more like a cinnamon bun. <laughs> we did huge props on a white psych, and we built a 20-foot toaster. We built this big, giant box of Eggo waffles because it was intrinsic to the comedy that they were large props. Mm-hmm. Like we had an 8-foot, beautiful stainless aluminum fork that matched a real fork and the cereal bowl matched a little bowl. And we would, we would intercut real props with big props for, <clears throat> for the gag. But because of the way the budgets were, and they were healthy budgets. Like we would shoot like for four or five days at Sony on a stage because we would amortize costs by doing several spots at once. Sure. But we would do one full day of just food of all the tabletop and I worked with my uh my uh I'm blanking of course I'm DP? blanking on his name uh, 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 yeah DP yeah, my DP yeah yeah <clears throat> and we would we learned so much and I think this is invaluable for the young filmmaker 
I learned so much about tabletop, not from the DP, but from the art director from the agency at Leo Burnett Chicago, Mm -hmm. who Peter Lohmeyer, who like invented Toucan Sam and had done breakfast shots forever. And he would be like, Jordan, let me just show you. And we had little mirrors and this and oh, it was just it's it, it, it was it's, just so fun. It's its own world. It's smoke and mirrors. It really yeah. is. Tabletop is such a like smoke yeah. and mirrors, and they're not using real butter. They're not using real anything. It's all yeah. fake, and it, you would never you die if you ate any of this food. <laughs> I, when I one of my first jobs where we had fake ice cream in the freezer, there was ice cream and frost on the side of the thing, and it would look like it was dripping. Cause it was like, it was melting. And I literally took my finger like that and I licked it and they go, what are you doing? And that's like, that's paint thinner or it's, you know, it's bug spray. Oh yeah. Never, never eat the props. Never um, eat the props. And that was the thing. I remember I saw, I was on set one day and they were doing ice cream and you can't shoot ice cream cause it's going to melt. So they had this beautiful, and I just was, my mind was blown. Like, why is that ice cream not melting? Like I was young. I had no idea what they were doing. Why is the ice cream not melting? They're like, dude, that's not ice cream. And I forgot what they use, but it's some, combination that just made it look beautiful it's it's a whole other world the one thing that the commonality of of commercials in indie film or studio film i mean i'm sure studio film they would have real fake ice cream Mm -hmm. and by the way if anyone listening has money to invest i would love to start a fake food company that fedexes or amazon primes overnight fake food to anywhere in the country because i was in I was in somewhere in Missouri or Kansas and I go, Hey, for the breakfast thing, like, do you have, does the prop house have fake eggs? Cause they had a film community and the guy goes, this is not LA. And I'm like, I want fake eggs so that they look fresh all day. Like sushi. You know how good the fake sushi. Looks? Oh, it's amazing. <clears throat> so why don't we have a company where we, we rent whatever meal you need, but it's plastic. It's a mold. It's a small it's, special, it, it's a small market. Yeah. It's a specialized market and you yeah. now it's about the cost of uh getting that getting the awareness to the company out to the world. Yeah. That would be the big cost involved. But That's other the, other than that I think it's a fantastic idea. And things that seem like crazy doesn't seem so crazy when you're looking at it from a commercial lens. Like something like that, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. But if you've been on a commercial set, you know how absolutely valuable fake food is. Because under the lights, it's going to look shitty. I mean, that, you know, it gets uh, hard and cold. And, oh, yeah. Well, but get- what I, the, the, the commonality between all forms of filmmaking is it really only matters what the camera sees. Yes. And, and, and your filmmaking craft is going to be the same. Like I remember when we had a snow cone machine and I literally saw the prop guy balling up red tape and blue tape and sticking in a snow cone. And I was like, oh, yeah, they're in the background. Like that's that's going to be perfect. They're just two kids. It's, it's blurred and it's blurred out. They're out of focus anyway. What a genius thing. Like that was it wasn't even like he was uh, ad libbing that he had planned on. We'll just crumple up some blue paper or something. It was it was tape like painter's tape. And it worked great. That would work in a movie. That would work on a commercial in a TV show. I think when you have more money, you don't get as inventive. Right. Yeah. In, in general. Now, how do you deal with clients and agency? Because that's an art form. It is an yeah. absolute <clears throat> art form how to deal with clients' ridiculousness sometimes. Like we just – it's it's the oldest joke. Like can you make the – can you make our logo just a bit larger? Like that's the, the running gag in commercials and in print commercials and everything. Can you just make the logo a little bit bigger? And and just dealing with agencies and the politics of agencies and dealing with the client and the politics of client. I don't know about you. I was in a job once where I was doing post and the, this is a true story. They were – the agency and the client were in the room. During our post session, the client fired the agency off, 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 um, off, like not in the room. Like there was obviously tension. And as the editor of that job, I, you know, we're Switzerland. We like, I, you know, if the agency yeah. says something, I'll do it. If the client says something, I do it. Like I have two masters I have to deal with. And then the director shows up and I just, 
I'm just there with, I'm like, we're, we're just Switzerland. So they, um, there was tension in the room. And then like after lunch, we hear what happened. And then the next hour of editing notes was a bit uh, rough to the point where there was a fist fight in the post house, in the post room. Oh there, was a, there was a literal fist fight. We had, and this is Miami. So, you know, um, and it was like a local, a fast food chain. Uh, and I remember, I remember it completely because the, the Cuban client, food? obviously, um, you know, which one it is. Yeah. You know, which one it is. Um, uh, yes, it's, it's the opposite of Pollo Loco. Um, yeah. so this is, was, we're talking about 20 years ago. And, um, and I remember because the client gave me like a stack of free coupons to get as much food as I wanted at the, at the fast food joint. I would just use them like crazy, but I got into a fist fight and I had to pull them apart and it was a whole thing. And, oh yeah. So that's a extreme version of dealing with client and agency. Um, how, how, what, any tips do you have for dealing with that? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yes. Um, another myth. The director uh, is involved in editing. Not always. That is a myth. Yeah. It's not, not always. Rarely nowadays. The, mm-hmm. the schedule is so tight that the editor, we've shipped, we've had the editor on set and delivered a cut that night at one in the morning for sure. approval mm-hmm. the next day. You know, So you kind of, you give the editor your notes and you hope she or he can take that into account but right. really you hand it over to the advertising creatives to to lead the ship in the editing with the editor and the Gener- editors have game the editors are fucking awesome and fast and they yeah. see the footage and it, it, it's it's okay it's 30, that you're not involved it's 30 seconds like i it, it's 30 but the longest post job i ever did uh i wasn't involved with it but i was i was uh, the tape dubber and they rented the room they were six months Sick. Wow. This was this was I've a never mi- heard of that. this was a million and a half dollar uh, foreign. It was for like Argentina, and it was like for Benson and Hedges cigarettes. Then when they would they could still do cigarette commercials. This L- they flew in an LA editor for I think four months out of that time. I was doing like the wow. I was doing the assistant editing at the time, and they just sat there for days and move a frame here move a frame there and i was just like this is insanity i think someone wanted to go to argentina i no i wasn't in Ar- this was in miami yeah. we didn't go to argentina in miami, yeah in miami no in argentina of course it would, but no we were in miami it was insane it's insanity well the way you know being a stand-up comedian helps me a lot dealing with clients <laughs> yeah, they, i can not, imagine no kidding because no. i have a sense yeah. of humor yeah and uh you know i i believe and my kids hear this since they were little. There's only solutions in filmmaking. Yeah. And I never pushed my kids. My son Jake is a writer. My son Ben's a director, DP. Gabby is at USC to study uh, in school dramatic arts. Jeezy's at UT in marketing at the Stan Richards School of Advertising. And I we pushed none of them into this. But I said, there's only solutions in filmmaking. So my my approach is... I say at the pre-pro, here's how tomorrow's going to work. Like I tell them how the day is going to work. I don't ask permission. I go, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to be at my monitor by myself, and you're going to be in the village. And the first couple of takes are going to suck. And the third take is going to be so bad that you're going to be like, does this guy know what he's doing? What is happening? Did we get the right actors? And then the fourth take is going to be magical. And the fifth take is going to be even better. And then before the sixth take, I'm going to come back to you and say, how can we make it better? Now I've laid out how I like to work, and it doesn't always go my way. And sometimes a creative director wants to come over and peek and whisper something here and there. Sometimes the client, like you said, the fist fight, sometimes when set the client and the agency don't get along. Oh, and they, they want two separate villages. But I try to implore them have one voice like everybody here is smart everybody's gonna have great ideas we have one day so i need you all to fight amongst yourselves before i come over after take five so that is my offensive approach to managing all the crazy notes 
But with that, but with that said, I don't mean to interrupt you, but with that said, you have the gravitas to pull something like that off. A young, a young guy or gal is not going to have that ability. So what advice would you give someone starting out the dealing with agency and client? Because it's a lot easier for someone like you or myself who has experience, who has some, some quote unquote gravitas with themselves that their agency has a, a level of respect there just because of the work that, that we've done. Yes. By the way, you can interrupt. It's your show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your guest. I'm very humbled I'm, to be here. I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just being polite. The, yeah. So I, I mentored a young man coming up and he went over to the village and the creative director said, could we try one where the guys like makes a lifts his eyebrow up or whatever it was. And the young director goes, no, that wouldn't be funny. And, and, and we walked and everybody went, Ooh, Ooh. and we walked away and I was on set sort of as a executive producer role. And I go, <laughs> Hey, um, what you just did was about as dumb as anything I've ever heard on a, on a film set, <laughs> a commercial film set. Why don't, why don't you do what he said? And then when you're done, go back over and apologize and say, Hey, uh, you know, I thought about it and you, it was funny. Thank you for that. I had a, an art director one time, senior art director, on a four-day shoot, Prilosec, OTC, Heartburn Medicine. We were flying every day We're because I'm fast, right? We're going. Then this, this one shot at the ocean, we we're trying to do like a forced perspective on a, on a prop lighthouse to make it look real. All of a sudden, we're on the East Coast. And the guy goes, it was like 40 minutes. He goes, hey, this is, we've been flying. Why is this, why is this taking so long? And Alex, I had a, some bullshit ready to sling, and I just stopped in my brain and looked at him and I said, it's taking too long because I didn't plan this properly. Wow. And the guy looked at me and he goes, fair enough. Take your, let's do it right. So my <laughs> advice to the young person is <laughs> don't try to, like, especially with seasoned ad guys, and by guys I mean women and men. They're super smart. They're very creative. There is a lot of on the line these days, like as you pointed out. Just don't try to bullshit them. Just say, hey, I'm, I got stuck or, you know, I take the blame. I had a prop guy make a sign with a scene down the middle that I was just like, oh, I can't shoot it. And it took another 45 minutes. We had to bring something in. And the producer goes, this is crazy. Yeah, that prop guy is she goes, well, it's not. I go, I'm really sorry. She goes, it's not your fault. I said, yeah, it is my fault. I hired that guy. So you have to be the captain of the ship and own your mistakes. Um, the, the craziest thing, I did a Happy Meal commercial. And it was a fantastical setting. And the client said, Jordan, I just don't understand. This is a decent budget. Why couldn't we get a real unicorn? No. And I said, well, they're extinct. <laughs> <laughs> was he, was he being serious? Totally serious. Dead serious. Like, she, why can't we get it? She, she, she can't, get, can't her. We get a real, why can't we get a real unicorn? Same thing. A copywriter said <laughs> the parrot was doing the voice activated car thing. <laughs> you know, like you talk to the car, yeah. like, Hey, play serious XM. And the parrot was in the, in the car. And the copywriter asked me, how are you going to teach the bird how to say the line? How does the bird learn its lines? And I went, rock, trainer, trainer, rock. Because we just dubbed it like we weren't even going to dub it in on the day. That's in post. <laughs> oh, so you Christ. have a sense of humor. You've got to roll, um, man. You got to you yeah. got to roll. I was once I was once. um <laughs> There was this one agency. It was, I think, it was an agency. Yeah, she was agency, and um, she she tell the story of she was just like this ball, ball. Like she really wasn't an, an ass. I'm sorry. She was really mean. She was nasty to people, and uh, I was doing post on it. And I'd been working for a while, and and she was like, "Why is that frame? Why does that look like that?" I'm like, "Oh well, it's that they're not using double double drop frame on set." And they're like, what do you mean? She's like, it, you know, it, it was just shot drop frame, but you need, if you want a really clean image, you need to use double, double drop frame. 
Double, double. And double, double drop frame. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I was at, by the way, I was, I didn't give a crap anymore. I was like, I don't care if I get fired or not. Um, and this is, I don't know when this was just fucking decades ago. And she's like, okay, okay. So it's, so, you know, when you go back on set tomorrow, go double, double, double. Tell frame. them you went double, double. <laughs> so she walked on set the next day with all the confidence in the world that she could muster. And she's like, I demand that this gets shot double, double drop frame. <laughs> To the DP and to the director. And they're like, where did you hear double double drop for it before? He said, Well, I was talking to the editor. And she's like, Oh, Alex. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> double double drop for it. It was just but you know, you know, that I don't suggest you do things like that, guys. <laughs> but I was an editor on my way out of that facility and I was a pissed off at the whole situation. They hadn't paid me, and there was a whole thing. So <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> now, um, do you think that being a commercial director in today's world is a good entrance to being a feature director? Because you've directed features. I've directed features. We both started off in commercials. But again, we started off at a different time. And you know, before Ridley, there was no commercial. To my knowledge, I think Ridley and Tony were the first couple guys – who broke through from commercials yeah, to then Michael Bay and yeah, well then yeah, then there was the whole crowd of like, the Fincher, Michael Bay, yeah. Spike Jones, Antoine Fuqua, all those kind of guys. But that was like a while before those guys. Commercials was like if you're a commercial director, don't even look at being a feature director. Like that was not a way in. Yeah, I think it's good only only to prove to a studio that you have uh, skills that you you have game. And that you've, I think a studio would like to know that you've navigated uh, the waters of co the corporate America with a, a team that you're collaborative. I you think know, even even investors on an indie film, mm -hmm. if if I saw that you had a Wrigley's Double Mint Gum <laughs> commercial, or because now you got Double Double on my. <laughs> <laughs> but was a shot double double drop frame that's yeah. the hashtag double double drop frame <laughs> if you had a Charmin toilet paper commercial and it's great looking film yeah. and good performances I would go okay this filmmaker knows how to knows how to the craft of filmmaking and knows how to navigate the waters I mean look I'll be I'll be honest I did one film for Merrimax uh, and Harvey Weinstein pre I mean I think he was still scummy at the time but no one was calling him out on it but that aside i don't think i knew how to na i was y too young i wish i had the experience i have now navigating the waters of a uh, quasi studio film i i wasn't prepared for the politics mm -hmm. of of dealing with that like i did my own indie where i raised some money I did two indies where I was a hired gun for like a $2 million film and had, you know, some decent actors, but you know, it was actually ironically a competitive commercial. Uh, it was HSI, which was a, like a big player in the commercials back in the day who wanted to have, like I said, at the beginning of the show, one of their film, you know, a film division and they yeah. funded a little indie and I could navigate that because everybody's kind of in it, you know, together. But it, doing commercials, if I if I had done like even five years of commercials before doing a Merrimax film, Waking Up in Reno, my film, with Billy Bob Thornton, who was not easy to deal with, Charlize Theron, who was on her way up, Patrick Swayze, who was the biggest star of them all, and Natasha Richardson, I think Jordan Brady would have been better equipped to navigate the politics behind the scenes. And how did you get that? How did you get? How did you get that gig? I got that gig because my first film, Dill Scallion, which premiered at Slam Dance. I don't know if the listener can see your shirt. Mm -hmm. Premiered at Slam Dance, and it was a country music Spinal Tap. Right. And then I did. The producers uh, saw the film, and it was called. Uh, they saw Dill Scallion, and I got hired like within a year to do. I wasn't even done editing at the time, but my agent had, you know, said, you got to see a cut of this. So I did a film called The Third Wheel with Luke Wilson and Ben Affleck and Matt Damon were producers. Matt Damon's in one scene 
and after his first take, I said, hey, no one's as good as you in the film. Could you just lower the bar a little bit? And this was this was before ah! Project before Project Greenlight, so I call it Project Stoplight, the third wheel. Like they wanted to be producers in the school of Merrimax too, because you know, oh yeah, they, done, they, did, yeah, yeah. they came through the Harvey School of Things, and then Harvey Weinstein bought the third wheel as a negative pickup. Now this is something that uh, the 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 indie film hustle t- uh, crew will. will uh, like to not know, but it's true. If you have Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who have won the Academy Award at this point, yeah, this is post this go, point, go, post Goodwill Hunting, right? Yeah. Post, but before they won, I was attached to direct this script, and Ben Affleck was going to be the 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 lead, and and Jay Lacopo, the writer and star, was friends with them and wrote it for himself. When Ben Affleck. Matt Damon, I don't think, wanted anything to do with anything. I think he mm-hmm. just wanted to act. But the movie gets put on hold because they win the Oscar. But then Affleck says, I'll be the buddy and shoot me out in four days, like a 24-day schedule. And Jordan Brady has just done this like $400,000 indie film that had like a little cult following from Slam Dance and making the rounds and got a video deal, blah, blah, blah. Um. So I'm hired to direct. We bang it out. They bring Harvey to the edit suite, which is an avid, you know, above a restaurant somewhere. <laughs> Harvey sees the movie, says he'll buy it on the spot, and fires the editor, brings in a new editor. Like, w- w- which to me is just not a classy move. <laughs> As but like, uh, on the, the editor on the on the on the on the. Um barometer of classy things that Harvey Weinstein does or has not done so seriously not a, not that bad not that bad of a move <laughs> I think he he jerked off on the ashtray <laughs> oh Jesus I'm sorry we don't want to go there with the show I apologize <laughs> nonetheless what I was going to say that your your fans may find interesting is to me it wasn't so much that Harvey liked the movie it was that hey, these two stars that just made me a lot of money are producers now. I'm going to buy their movie. Well, it could have been just like of course, 90 minutes of a close-up of, uh, you know, a, a, a Coke of a new, can or something. Yeah, it, it, yeah. exactly. He had, it was a political move. It was a political move. I think it was a political move. He did pony up for some additional photography like the next summer, and it took forever. And so basically – when he saw the final version of the third wheel, we had a meeting and he said, I'm really happy with the third wheel. And my agent had given me waking up at Reno, which was like a redneck comedy. And I said, Hey, by the way, I read the script. I think you own it. I want to direct it. And he said, okay. Like it was a 12 minute meeting at the peninsula hotel in between massages or something. And, um, Funny enough, uh, many people who are listening know that I was in Project Greenlight season two. Oh, I did not know that. I was, but no, it doesn't sound as impressive as it, as it is. I was in the first episode for five seconds in the montage at the beginning saying, I will do anything to make <laughs> it in here. I will do anything to make it in the business or something along those lines. I did a whole YouTube video about it and showed it. And, and because a lot of people like, you know, we know what project green light is and I know it came out a few years ago, but project green light was, it was insane when it came out. Like when I, by the way, when that aired, I got phone calls from all around the country. Like, did you, I just saw you on HBO. Were you just on HBO? It was like, oh yeah. And in the background, I had like my wall of VHSs that were all color coordinated for my video. Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was good. Time. But here's so, but my problem with the first season, oh, was Chris Moore, many. Chris Moore was also the producer along with, uh, sure. With Matt and Ben. He's sure. a nice guy. Okay. But he is smart enough. All three of those guys are smart enough that that first season that they allowed the guy to shoot oh. under the L train. <laughs> you read my mind. To me, it was mind. like, I was like, this first is day. just for television. That's, this is first first day. First day. First under, day you're uh, going to shoot under a train. Like, they must have been snickering and salivating going, 
this is good television. Oh, no, it's all about – I realized that years later. I, I was like, oh, thank God I didn't get on that show because it was – I oh, my God. It was it – was, it was, uh, you want to watch a tra- mantra. I mean, you it is. It is. You you want to watch a train wreck, watch any of those seasons um at all. But it was just insane. You were just sitting there like and the DP didn't want a shot list. He didn't believe in shot listing. And it was just like this all this stuff. And it was just like, this is this is horrible. This is absolutely horror. It's a train wreck. Um, but yeah, I, I, the second season, which would have been the battle, it was the Battle of Shaker Heights. The one with um, Shia, oh, a young, yeah. a young Shia LaBeouf, uh, yeah. was it was uh, was in that, and that was uh, that was an interesting season. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've been actually, I have a friend of mine who's good friends with Chris, Mr. Uh, Chris Moore. I don't know him, but I told him next time you talk to Chris, tell him thanks for fucking nothing for not casting me in season two of uh, of Project yeah. Greenlight. So I'm waiting to actually meet him and talk to him about. It. I'm like, you know, man, you could have had me. <laughs> Their loss. Obviously, I have no, I have no regrets. I, I feel fortunate. Uh, I'm a, a kid from Ohio with no ties to show business. Although I live next to Paul Lynn in Mount Vernon, Ohio, who was the original Center Square. If you were, if you, you are, that. you sir, you sir are dating yourself and me yeah. at the exact same time because I know that reference. But I, I did. I came out here. Yeah. Look, comedy, stand-up comedy, got me everything. Stand-up comedy keeps me grounded. I've made documentaries about stand-up comedy. And and taking a page from your book, realized, you know, after doing those features, and it, what I think what the, the commercial director and the feature director, obviously if one of the movies is a hit, you can just coast and they cherry-pick you. But if you're a working director in both realms, as soon as you leave commercials for six months – to prep and shoot a film or even a, a you know, a, a no budget indie film. When you come back to commercials, you've lost all momentum. I mean, I did again, three, again unless you're hit for oh. films, unless, yeah, unless you're, you're hit. hit. Yeah. And I, I had, you know, critical flops. It was like starting over each time and I was making great headway. So I said in commercials and I, I told uh, myself in 2000, it was like 2003 or four. Okay, I'm just going to do. I let my agent go. I said I'm not resigning. It's better for you if I don't resign because I'm not going to do another movie. So I'm going to do commercials for three years, and that turned into like 17 years. And that they... three year period, just I woke up like when you're doing four and five day ego waffle shoots, making serious bank and like oh, from it was oh four to to from. 04 to 07 quarterly five day shoots you're making more than if you were doing oh a, Mer- a Merrimax feature really oh oh no question it was much more so, money in commercials before yeah. much more and did you do music videos now, as well you did some music videos as never. well I've, never I've never done like a couple in a couple in my life for you know friends that favors you, you would yeah. never yeah but no never cracked the music video thing I mean my son cranks out music videos and he's got it down the the problem he that i'm talking to him about he's he'll be 25 he's 24 he um ben brady ben brady.tv he's over delivering like they don't care if you show up at the a7 and you're bringing out the red and the steady cam and some of the like some of the uh rap guys don't know the difference if if you did it with your iphone like right. you could actually pocket more money, but he said, throwing my own philosophy back in my face, it's for the real. And I'll always say, invest in your real over the revenue. Oh, uh, there's, there's, there's no question because I know. Hey, look, if he's hustling music videos right now in L.A., God bless him because it's that's a hustle. That- he's got one a country video coming up. He's done a gospel video that crushed it. A handful of. You know, these uh, up and coming rap guy, hip hop guys with, you know, millions of views. And yeah, but and those invented. budgets, but but those budgets, are you looking at twenty five hundred five thousand if you're lucky? Uh, I, I can't speak for him, but it's it's between five and fifteen. On some yeah, of it's something. Yeah, so, and he's yeah. actually he's working at the upper echelon of yeah. music videos right now. Yeah. If that's the case, because I, I mean, I remember when I, I did a I did a run of like two years of music videos here in L.A. And the budgets were just. 
And that's directing. Wait, just what? Just good or bad? No, it's horrible. Uh, oh, okay. because, because, but the only way I made money was direct, um, produce, uh, and did all the post. So I was able to combine yeah. it all as a package deal. And that's how I got gigs. I got gigs on, and actually my budgets were much, I had, I, I actually was doing 50,000 to 80,000 dollar budget music videos but they were that's like good, that's a good budget yeah but they were like for comedy central and it was for a big stand-up guy and he was doing music videos for his stand-up special and it was like a, it, it all kind of amortized out it wasn't a straight up music video it was kind of like a combination of commercial music video and all that kind of stuff but those budgets were insane um i did one one stand-up comedy special mm-hmm. for maria bamford i'm really proud of called the special 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 where she performed in her house for her parents. Oh, that's amazing. That's and, amazing. And, it, and we did it for a, a – it it's a now defunct website called chill.com. Yeah, I remember that one. And yeah. chill, chill froze. And so <laughs> but, uh, we, made it, yeah, we made it on the cheap, and then she got the rights back and sold it to Netflix, and it, it, it was a huge hit. And she actually – she actually sent me a, a personal check That's after so the sale to Netflix because we made it for the website. Yeah. And she goes, no, I know you called in a lot of favors. I know you did it, you know, uh, on the, on the cheap and, and we put all the money into the special. Sure, 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 sure. And she goes, you know, I mean, that was, I didn't ask for anything. And I, that's a, I mean, I just love that. That's amazing. But I don't think it, it made me, the reason I'm telling you is I don't think now like music videos, I don't think there's a market for stand-up specials. Because Everybody, I directed a stand-up special every, a couple years ago, and we did it at the where is it? Um, at the Steve typewriter? No, the um, the, the comedy the, is it the comedy store? Not the comedy, comedy store. Not Black the comedy Black. store. Uh, next, keep going. What's the other ones? Improv. La, improv. I think we did it at the improv, and um. And we did like one of those little small rooms that they had, and it was very intimate. And um, an annex, improv annex. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was the yeah. side. It, it, it might not be the improv. It might be one of the other ones. But it was one of those big yeah. ones that that we did, and um, and we did it. We shot it all. And we shot it with some some black magics, and we had some cranes and all that stuff. We shot it out in one night, two two performances. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I edited it. Yeah, I edited it, put it all together. I think it got sold to a uh, a distributor who has not uh, not uh, <laughs> not uh, <clears throat> haven't received any. No, not yet. This is prior to my uh, experience in the distribution realm. Everyone listening, so that's why I have firsthand experience on uh, getting screwed multiple times by uh, distributors. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Now back to the show. I, why, you know, I bl- I'm blanking on the name, but Taylor Swift. No, no. <laughs> he he's a magician comedian. Okay, and I interviewed him for my podcast. Respect the process. Like a week after I interviewed you. Okay, and I had just self distributed one of two of my documentaries before getting distribution. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know. That's the big secret there is you can self-distribute and still get a distributor and get on – like I I am Road Comic. I did myself for five bucks and then got a distributor with Comedy Dynamics who got it on Netflix and Hulu with an ad rev deal. I saw my own commercials during the Hulu version with commercials plugged in. Mm-hmm. I saw my own Dodge commercials play during so- my film. And the budget for the movie was less than lunch for the three day dodge. Shoot. So you basically that that's when the space time continuum exploded in your yeah. mind. When yeah. you're watching your own movie, when your commercial comes up on your own movie. By the way, how was your experience with uh with them? Have you been paid? I was paid. I was paid uh not without some, you know, emails like, Hey, it's been a while. Hey, I haven't heard from you guys in a while. And they always answered, they always came back. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and I'm Taylor, gonna tell you- Taylor Hughes. Taylor Hughes was a magician, and after I interviewed you and I, I was talking to him, I said, based on my experience, you need to self distribute your own comedy magic special. Absolutely, which he did Absolutely. at the Dynasty Typewriter. He put it on uh, like Vimeo on demand. Sure, sure, sure. 
And I said, you know, even if it just it serves as a publicity tool, forget the money, but you will make money rather than sitting around in COVID with nothing. And then he got it on uh, Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And you'll make I, you'll make something. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I am a disciple of the indie film hustle. <laughs> I appreciate I, I, that. I would, I mean, anyone should do it. And especially if you know going in, like I wish I knew going in with some of my indie films, my documentaries, that I was going to do that. But because now I tell anybody doing a doc, tourniquet on spending. Absolutely. Crank that tourniquet on your spending and don't. And, and I, I would I would even now do Zoom calls Whereas six months ago, I would have gone, no, you got to fly to oh, yeah, absolutely. Detroit and get the interview. Now I would just record the Zoom because the, the viewer is used to it. Or you could at least even, worst case scenario, you could send them a small camera, have them set it up, and still do the Zoom interview, but have them set up a camera and film themselves in a higher That's res. genius. I mean, it's, it's what the news, that's what news organizations yeah. are doing right now. So they, you know, set somebody up or hire someone local to kind of just go and set things up or something along those lines. Much easier, much, much yeah. easier, much more cost effective, um, to do it. Uh, I'm going to give you, I want to, I wanted to give you a, a quick LA story because I think you'll find this funny. Mm -hmm. And then after, after this LA story, then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up because I, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time, sir. I know, uh, you're a busy, busy man. I appreciate your time on here. But, um, when I, I moved to a place, it's such an LA story. So I moved, um, to uh, a, a townhouse, uh, here in LA and across the hall from my townhouse, there was this guy that I kept looking at. He's like, he looks familiar. Who is this guy? And I like, I'm like, I, like, I, I you know, I was, I couldn't look him up. I didn't know how to look him up. So I was like, this guy seems he's not an actor though. He's, but I've seen him a lot. And this is we're going back twelve years, twelve years or so. And and then I bump into him, uh, you know, groceries or something like that uh, out in the in the courtyard. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? And, he, and I look at his face. I was like, is that? And he goes, hi, my name is Cato. <laughs> And I'm like, are you Cato Kalen? <laughs> Cato Kalen <laughs> lived across the hall from me. So I had my post, I had my post suite in my extra bedroom in my house. So I would have clients come over all the time. And I remember I had this one filmmaker who was in, um, he was in Titanic. He had a, a bit part in Titanic and we were working on some projects and he was just couldn't under like he couldn't keep himself in his seat he would like look out the window waiting to see if kato would walk out he was like freaked out that kato kaylin lived across this nicest guy by the way kato was the sweetest nicest guy ever but that's such an la story that's funny now do you know to that point when i have clients from chicago mm -hmm. come out like for some you know whatever the product is the client not so much the agency people but i i do it to them if i can they kind of know my trick, but the, we're at the client dinner. We're in Santa Monica or Beverly Hills at a steakhouse or something. Sure. I will have so many. Oh, you just miss Gina Davis. <laughs> or if I go to the back, like you, Jude Law was in the urinal next to me. Really? Oh my God. Yes. Tom Cruise. And just, they will, you just miss Tom Cruise. <laughs> <clears throat> and and they'll, you'll hear it like, no, last night the director <laughs> saw Michael Keaton at the salad bar. With Jack Nicholson. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> they, were, they were talking Joker Batman. <laughs> and they buy it. And they buy Oh, that's great. Yeah. That, that's good times. So um, you have this amazing uh, master class in regards to commercial directing. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, my goodness. Well, I commercial directing boot camp is an in-person thing. And I'm doing – it's sold out for October uh, 10th. You're still doing it? Are you still doing it? Are you still doing it this yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, I did it in January, then COVID hit. So I had one in June and it was about half sold out when COVID hit in March. So I pushed it. I, well, I have, other than the election of Donald Trump, I've never been so wrong. I thought, ah, by the time j late June comes around, we'll be over this COVID. <laughs> this is, this like, is just a passing fact. This, this is in March. I'm like, wait, can't, how long is it going to last? Like, I mean, they can't, they can't like shut down the entire world. That's insanity. I mean, in, in mid mid March, I had two juicy gigs, uh, two juicy gigs. A one day shoot for some medicine. It was basically like 
you know, the mom in the driveway taking the pill. Yeah. Or feeling good because she'd already taken the pill. A bunch of animation that someone else would do. And then an end shot. And and that's where, like we said, the director, you don't get on the phone and change it to a big sweeping opening shot from the driveway with a crane. You go, yep, I can do this and I'll get a good performance. Yeah. So I have that job. Then there was this other multi-day job. And I was like, that's going to be, that's going to drive me through the summer. Monday morning, they're gone with COVID. And I'm sitting around and I go, you know, I can't do the boot camp or maybe I can, but I'll just do a master class. So I, I cherry picked some of the lessons and I did a two hour thing in my office. My son, Ben shot it for me, you know, came, and I edited it. And a couple of weeks later in April, I put it out and it has, it has been very helpful to a lot of filmmakers. Great. So it's commercial directing. Fil- uh, I put everything at commercial directing film school. So commercial directing masterclass.com or commercial directing film school. And it's a, uh, you know, I put it up on a teaching platform and, you see behind the scenes that I've had shot with my son as he grew up filmmaking. I would say, shoot me directing. I talk to the camera like while I'm directing from a couple years ago, a national Toyota commercial. There's some me directing Catherine Hahn in the Chrysler minivan stuff. And I, I knew someday it would be valuable behind the scenes footage. So I don't think there's much like this with, you know, a working commercial director showing you this kind of behind the scenes. Right. There's a lot of great products out there. There's how to do music videos. But I, I really haven't seen any, I really haven't seen much on commercial directing. And I mean, I actually went to the, oh, what was it? The, uh, the workshops in Maine. Um, oh, those are great. There, so I actually went there to take a commercial directing course back in the 90s when I was starting to get my commercial yeah. reel going. And, and, you know, they had the guy from, uh, the, the, the client from, um, oh God, the biggest... They buy uh, Procter and Gamble, so the oh, Procter, wow, yeah. they had, had that come in and like you know. By the way, everybody Procter and Gamble, I think I don't know if they still do, but they were the they spent the most on commercials ever than anybody else by far. For, They're that's also, uh huh. Yes, that is true. B and G, and they have all your famous products. Mm-hmm. Brands. Every everything. They are also so inclusive of people from underrepresented populations. They were the first to really say, like, hey, why don't we put a same-sex couple in our toothpaste commercial? That's, hey, pretty, ball- that's feature- pretty ballsy. That's pretty ballsy yeah, look- for a company that size. Does it? Can it be a black couple? Why does it have to be a white couple all the time? Like, they really are forward-thinking with inclusion. Good. Before, you, you know, the, the, the murders in 2020. I mean, they've been doing this for mm-hmm. years. So, uh so I put out the master class. It's doing great. I've had about 350 students from eight different countries. And can I throw out a deal for your listeners? Sure, of course. So you go to just go to commercial directing film school and there's links to everything. My podcast, book, <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. But if you type in when you sign up for commercial directing master class, you're about to check out. And it's two hundred and forty nine fucking dollars. Why don't you use the code Nifty Fifty and take fifty bucks off of that? Nice, nice, well played, sir. Well played. I'll put that link. I'll put that link in the show notes. And, and, then, and can I tell you one more thing? Yeah, yeah. So on Thursday night, All right? I had another. Uh, no, you don't know this one. Okay. I had another behind the scenes that I couldn't put into the master class. About how to direct cats. So I not, and, 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 not, and not cats the movie. No, no, no. <laughs> cats as in the animal. Feline critters. Yes. Because I've directed right? about seven or eight cat commercials. Because you're the cat costume. You're the cat guy. To those you're, people, I'm the cat guy. You're the cat guy. You're the cat, the cat guy. guy. <laughs> I do dogs, but I really do cats. Alpacas, <laughs> but not llamas. <laughs> And so I put up a, a mini course for uh, a lower, like, entry price, and it's directing cats with a 17-minute behind the scenes. Same thing. I'm talking to the camera, and here's why it's worth it just for this. I put in the original agency brief that they sent to the directors, and then I put my treatment so you can download both, 
and then the production notes and the script notes and all that. So you really see a case study. And if you can direct cats, you can direct anything. <laughs> so, and, and then if, by the end of that course, I give you the, I think I give you the nifty 50 code. Like if you take that course and then you take the other one, it's like getting it free. Cause right. I, I got the code, the nifty 50 code. That's awesome. That's awesome. And now didn't you just release a, a feature film, sir? So people on YouTube were talking about my first film, Dill Scallion, The Country Spinal Tap. And last night someone tweeted, you know, it's on YouTube. Someone like four days ago, four or five days ago, put it on YouTube. And I wrote the guy, I go, hey, you know, I was going to put it up, but I'm the, it's my copyright. I have the publishing to the music, which I don't know if you teach that, Alex, but if you can control the, I made more money off the publishing of that movie. You know, owning the music in the movie, the original music, mm-hmm. than the movie itself. Well, with that said, though, in today's world, publishing is not what it used to be, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. It's a little different nowadays. Yeah. But yes, if you could own publishing, that was – that's the thing. Absolutely. So uh, I asked the guy to take it down, which I think he did. And I, I, I put it on Vimeo. Uh, so it's, you know, Vimeo on demand forward slash Dill Scallion. And I, I put it up for rent a dollar ninety nine, buy it for three ninety nine. I'm going to get up a hundred percent of whatever comes in to St. Jude Children's Hospital because it's a twenty year old film. I wanted to put it up for free, but if there's a chance to help one of my favorite charities, why not? Sure. So there's no discount there. You just you're going to spend two bucks, and hopefully we can make a few thousand dollars. That's uh, awesome. Over the next few. Weeks. I will the chair. I will put that in the show notes as well. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the commercial business today? Study advertising the way you study filmmaking. Watch so you know how to tell this. Yeah, you know how to tell a story in 30 seconds versus uh just some really cool shots. And I would also say don't open uh, don't start your shoot day with the wide shot because it barely makes the commercial. And you, it takes right. so much effort to plan. So right. And, I've shot so many uh, wide shots that never ever make it. That's in my book Commercial Directing Voodoo, ten dollars on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you yeah, are everyone you're hustling, baby. I love it. I'm like Mr. Haney from Green Acres, if you want a dated reference. Oh, man. It's like a Bedouin bazaar on my website. Holy uh, cow. Yeah, the, the DP and the AD will always want to start with the wide shot. And then the agency will be picking apart the wide shot. I don't like that plan. I don't like this. I don't like the way she says that in the middle of the spot. And you're like, no, I'm just letting the actors do it. It's never going to be in the cut. I just want the actors to do the whole script. Well, but could she say it this way? Can we try an alt line? No, the the alt line isn't funny in the wide shot. So if you start your day, you're going to be like 45 minutes late because you fucked around on this wide shot. And then in the edit bay, the editor goes, I don't well, need, we don't even need the wide that's, shot. Well, that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the in- film industry or in life? It's we, not me. Amen. Very, very true. And I'll ask you three of your favorite films of all time and three of your favorite commercials of all time. That's so hard because on any given day. What's the, well, today's that day. Yeah. So whatever okay. today is, what are those three films and three commercials if you can think of them? Yeah. I mean, film wise, I always love Mel Brooks' History of the World. Part, like, I, is, I that, just, is this a real world part two? It's part two. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Of part two. I always laugh at that, you know, I, and it's silly and it's probably outdated style of humor, mm-hmm. but I, I love that. Uh, best in show. I always laugh at. Of course. Of course. I mean, that's like, it's so sly. And, so good. So good. And, you know, there's a film called blue in the oh. trilogy of, oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, Christoph Kosloski. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I've seen that film. When I say I've seen it 25 times, it's not a comedy. 
not by, just, by any stretch. It's it's a, it's a, it's a it's moving it's a moving those, painting. It's a moving painting. It's amazing. It's just so beautiful. I love it's red. So like I love yeah, red. Yeah. Red I just Iran Jacob was just oh my god. She was amazing in that both those films. Amazing. Juliette Belnouche is in blue if I'm not mistaken. Yes, she, I I think she's also is she in what was the one that uh Double, not Kristen double life. Stewart was in with the the clouds. It's like the clouds of Saint Laurent. I don't know. I don't remember that one. I don't remember. Oh that one. yeah. Um, and then three commercials that kind of kind of get sting in your stay in your head because I've got a few in my head that I, I and they're all from the same group of directors. Wow. I mean, I watch so many commercials. Is there anything that stuck out? Yeah. Well, my my wife's first spec spot for Bridgestone Tires where we we rented the location that has the Michael Bay tree. It's called A Boy in His Tire. And we shot, it was the last of the film days 10 years ago. And it it got her shortlisted at Cannes, at the advertising can, not the real can. Mm-hmm. And that spot is so beautiful. And it's my wife, it was my wife's entry into the marketplace. Mm-hmm. So, and it got a lot of press. And so that's near and dear. That's like a personal one. You're asking for ones that, that people would know. Um, <sighs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple. Yeah, and see if you could, yeah. So Aaron Burr, Michael Bay, classic, classic uh, Aaron Burr. I mean, and, and a lot of people crap on Michael Bay and uh, I'm the first to say that, you know, other than the rock bad boys and Armageddon, cause Armageddon is just yeah. fun. Um, there's a handful of movies that, you know, that he's not the greatest storyteller, but visually there's, he changed the game. Action movies changed after Bad Boys and The Rock. Like, completely. Like, everybody's tried to beat Michael Bay. So I'm going to say Aaron Burr. I'm going to say um, there was a Levi commercial that David Fincher did with uh, Claire Font, uh, what's her name? Claire from Meet, Meet Joe Black, uh, which is oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the one that, that, that there's like, uh, at last, that, that whole spot was amazing. And I'm not sure if it was Bay or if it was Spike Jones, but Remember, did you ever remember the, it was super mint green commercial where they were going to do a, they were like moving the camera, like they're about to like do some sort of surgery and they're sitting like, he's sitting in this chair, this kid's sitting in this chair and all the doctors around and like moving the camera and the camera's like angling in, like they're going to shoot something into this kid's face. And all of a sudden the camera just goes whoosh, whoosh, and like snaps like a stapler and it leaves a di- one of those little uh, Levi divots. Like oh, off the that's leave, funny. on his nose, he's a he goes stylish since 1950 something or whatever it is. And I think it was either Spike Jones or, or Fincher on that one. I remember, but those are those are three that I remember. Uh, J- uh, Jason Momoa in Rocket Mortgage for the Super Bowl. Oh, so good! Oh my god, he ripped so, off his face, and so I know good. the creative team, and I know the effects team. Oh, so and good! Our, uh, that was also the effects were also um, the guys that did the Ego suit. <laughs> The back For the and we're circling like, and we're circling back to nobody's, the end. <laughs> but when you you know I I'm when you see when you have a connection to something yeah and Michael Corbet who was a creative director that went over to work for Rocket Mortgage that was his first spot as in house so creative director and then uh, you know the guys at, at uh, Legacy Effects formerly Stan Winston when you see they all work you're like I know these guys and I didn't I loved the spot before I even saw that. And it was great. And I don't know if you saw the meme uh, that was flying around uh, Facebook and Instagram where it was a picture of Jason Momoa in that spot when he has like balding, his arms are really thin and he looks horrible. And on the top of it, there's a picture of him, I'm Aquaman. And he goes, shooting 4K on your iPhone, yeah. shooting 4K on a red. <laughs> it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Now, uh, Jordan, where can people now, find you? Th- yeah, that's two. Here's okay. Third is uh, Geico Whale by the Pelorian Brothers, where a guy goes into the belly of the whale. Like, and another guy comes in his kayak, and they're in this, it's clearly a set, you know? And then another guy comes in, and they're like, what the fuck is happening? And the guy's like, I just saved 15%, you know, my car insurance. So I think that's a really funny one. I'll send you a link. <laughs> send me a link. I'd love to see that one. Um, and where can people find you, Jordan? I would say uh, on Twitter, it's that Jordan Brady. 
Mm-hmm. Instagram, that Jordan Brady. I'm pretty good on Instagram these days. That took a little learning. I am not on TikTok. I don't know if I have the bandwidth. No, don't don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I, I, I don't have it's the bandwidth. Fine. But Commercial Directing Film School is where I would send people because at Commercial Directing Film School, I got the master class and the cats and the boot camp and the book and the podcast. And uh, I don't. I, and I have a hot sauce called Oh So Delicious Hot Sauce. Obviously. Where we... We give because that was the twist, right? That was the that was the the pivot, as they say. And we give one dollar from every bottle of hot sauce to nationalmilitaryfamilies.org, which is a great charity helping military families and veterans uh, reunite after service. They have camps for kids, like your mom's in Afghanistan or your dad's in you know Iwo Jima or somewhere. They, these kids are left alone. The kids pay the price. So uh, we, we give a dollar per bottle to that charity. And everything is at Commercial Directing Film School. My friend, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. It's so fun. I can't believe it. Thank I, you. I mean, it's uh, we could talk for, again, another few hours, I'm sure. But I hope this has helped a few filmmakers understand the world of commercial directing because I know a lot of them are like, hey, maybe I should just do some commercials. And you, you know what? There's a thi- it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah, it's- don't, you don't want to dabble. You can't dabble in commercials. You might be able to dabble in music videos, maybe, but commercials is just a it's a little bit, a little bit bigger. You it's might the, want to commit, and it'll pay off in experience when you go to do your feature. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was a much better director because of all the time I spent on set as a commercial director, and and by the time I did my first real narrative stuff, um, I was a you know I just knew how to run a set. It was really really a great experience. But unlike you and me, uh, today these kids they could just go on shoot and they could just edit on their laptops, and and I had to go uphill barefoot in the snow snow. to edit on an Avid on a Quadra 750 with 33 megabytes, 33 megabytes, uh, a Quadra 350 with 33 megahertz, excuse me, of screaming power back in the day with my video vision rat tail. Yes. With the, uh, with 15 scuzzy drives hooked up to get a gig. (laughs) You are old. (laughs) Hey, and thank you for this podcast and all the information. And, you know, I listened to the show and, I know your take on how distributors can really like I had a distributor just wanted the fee, just (laughs) wanted the fee, just like even like, did I have weed? Like, shouldn't you be selling my film? And you position it in a positive way. You don't just when I listen to the show, you give us the warning shot over the bow, but you have solutions for people. Right. How to take charge to. of their career, how to build an audience. And and I admire it, man. I'm I am of your school of thought. And I, I Thank just you, think man. what you're doing and, and sharing sharing the knowledge is really cool. I, I appreciate it. I tr- it, look it's it, distribution specifically, I think, is such a it's such a, a treacherous uh, part of uh, the filmmaking journey. It really is, and it is predatory, and it's a little rough. But I try to shine some light, and sometimes I might get a little negative. But unfortunately, I rather tell. I, I always tell people, I rather you hear it from me than lose your film. Yeah. For five years, I rather you hear me going, "Dude, you got to do this, this, and this. If you don't, you're gonna get taken advantage of." So I try to do the best I can. But I really do appreciate that, and I appreciate what you're doing with your uh, your podcast as well. Your <laughs> podcast is pretty awesome and uh, and pretty funny and really entertaining. And if anybody wants to know more about commercial directing, I would definitely recommend uh, you listening to Jordan's podcast. And I will have that in the show notes as well. Oh, Jordan, thank you. Yeah, very accessible too. I mean, you email, DM me. I'm I'm not hiding, you know, in the hills. <laughs> We might. Well, actually, actually, we are now. Actually, we are heading in the hills now. But Jordan, thank you again for being on the show, brother. I appreciate it, man. I'll talk to you later. I want to thank Jordan for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe today. If you want to get links to anything we talked about in this episode, including his master class on how to become a commercial director, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash 440. And if you haven't already, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. Oh, and before I forget, please do not forget to check out next week's episode 441, which I will be bringing to you David F. Sandberg, 
the director of Shazam, as well as Lights Out and Annabelle. It is an amazing conversation I have with him, how he got his start with a simple, low-budget short film, Lights Out, which blew him up to be making $100 million plus studio films. It was a fascinating conversation, and I cannot wait to share it with you guys, so definitely check it out. That's it for this episode, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 